Hello and welcome to today's concert. And once again, we're back at Ellesmere College in Shropshire, this time in the school chapel. Last time we were at the Schultz, the big romantic organ in the big school hall, this time in this beautiful chapel. This chapel actually burnt down in 1966, so it was completely rebuilt and given a new organ. This was built in 1968 by Hill, Norman and Beard, and it's unashamedly 1960s in its style. It's neoclassical, which was a fashion at the time, um, very much along very clean lines and very pure old-fashioned lines. All the pipes are on show, more or less, and it's an amazing look. Um, and you get this sort of very chiffy sound, we call it. There's a lot of attack and speech on the note. You can hear at the very beginning of the note. So that's what gives it its sort of neoclassical sound. So I've chosen music which hopefully will show it at its best in this beautiful chapel. And you'll notice all around the place um, there are the school emblems which include a, a raven with a ring and a crown and that's because we're in St Oswald's Chapel. Now St Oswald was the uh, 7th century king of Northumbria and he died in battle not very far from this very place. The tale goes um, that his pet raven was sent uh, to give a proposal to a pagan princess who uh, Oswald wanted to marry. So he sent the raven with his uh, gold ring, as you do. Um, unfortunately, it came with the caveat that she had to convert from being a pagan to Christianity. She declined and sent the raven back. I'm not sure how the raven conveyed all this. However, um, that's the result of it. I mean, I, I've been dumped by text, but never by raven. So it's a, quite a, a novel way of doing things. But that's the tale. And that's why this emblem is seen all around this chapel of St. Oswald and the crowns because he was a king. Staying with the bird theme, um, I thought I'd tie in with a piece that Tom wrote for me in 2016 for the organ of Adlington Hall in Cheshire. Now, that organ has manuals only. It's from the late 17th century and has been believed to have been played by Handel himself. Again, almost classical in style, very simple instrument. And Tom chose some uh, sounds which would depict birds. It's called Pavan of the Birds, uh, an ancient dance and depicting birds. So you get this sort of dance-like quality with it. Bird songs at quite high pitches in places, but some lower tones, uh, it might be birds sort of jumping around on the ground, and various different sounds. I don't know if there's a, a raven in there. However, I hope you enjoy this. Lots of bird sounds in this. This is Pavan of the Birds by Tom Scott.
I'd like to hear something quite sort of refreshing and new on this instrument. So I hope you enjoyed hearing that. And it's a great acoustic in here as well. Um, it also does quite classical pieces. So I'm going to play some Mozart now. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart needs very little introduction. He wrote some 600 pieces of music and didn't even make it to his 40th birthday. An incredible character and a great, great genius. Um, I'm going to play a movement from one of his symphonies, Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor, one of only two symphonies he wrote in a minor key, and probably one of the most famous. I'm going to play the first movement. Now Mozart wrote this about three years before he died, and he used to write symphonies in groups of three. He'd sometimes be working on several pieces all at once, and he used to write symphonies, maybe two or three at once. Sometimes we're not entirely sure if they were ever actually played. This is um, a brilliant piece of music. It set up an example for many composers in the future because it starts with the accompaniment. And if you think of pieces that came along afterwards, say Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, Mendelssohn violin concerto, this was the first one that set up a piece which began with accompaniment and then the melody came in. Um, Mozart, of course, fell on hard times many times, and so around this time he was uh, in quite a sort of depression, really, because his finances weren't doing very well. So whether that's what's reflected in this piece, it's a uh, it's very energetic and it's quite tragic at the same time and it's a sort of great big gestures within it but I think it transfers really well to this style of instrument. So I hope you enjoy this. This is the first movement from Mozart's Symphony Number no. 40.
To fit with this beautiful chapel, I thought I'd play a piece by Bach from one of his cantatas, his hunting cantata, actually. Uh, and this is Sheep May Safe the Greys. In peace, your sheep may safe the greys. Um, written for the Duke of Saxe Weissenfels for his birthday. Um, it's thought that it's called the hunting cantata because it's thought that they went on a hunt that day and it took place in the hunting lodge, the first performance. So it's not a religious cantata, but a sec secular one, um, which sets the Duke as sort of the prince of the land, almost as a religious figure looking after his flock of sheep, his people. Uh, this movement's very complimentary, and of course, Bach was uh, definitely trying to stay on the right side of the, uh, the high up people in the land by doing this. But it's a beautiful, beautiful aria, this. Um, simple accompaniment originally for flutes in the, what is the right hand in this version, uh, and a melody which I take between the treble and the tenor and a very simple bass line. Of course, Sheep May Save the Graze has become a very, very popular piece of uh, music, often at weddings, but also, as I'd like to say, it's also very popular at butchers' funerals. I'll take a moment to get that one. Yes. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoy this. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of music and suits his place wonderfully. This is In Peace, Your Sheep May Save the Graze by Johann Sebastian Bach.
as I've said, Mozart was often um, in debt. He wasn't particularly great with money and often owed people a lot of money, especially on his rent and uh, some gambling debts as well. However, to pay things off, he used to accept more commissions for music. And in the last year of his life, he wrote a huge amount of music, including some pieces he didn't particularly want to work on, which were the pieces for a musical clock. Now, these were for um, an exhibition place in Vienna, a mausoleum to a, a field marshal. And the idea was that on the hour, a large clock with pipes in would play um, a funereal piece of music or a remembrance piece of music composed by various composers, including Mozart, who wrote several pieces. And the piece I'm going to play you now, the Fantasia in uh, F minor, is thought to be one of those pieces. Mozart complained that it was going to be played on this thing with you know, very high-pitched sort of squeaky sounds like that, nothing low. Um, he said it sounded like a child's toy to his wife and he wished he could hear it on the organ, the organ which Mozart himself called the King of Instruments. He never actually got around to doing that. However, many versions of this exist and it wasn't until into the 19th century that it was actually arranged for piano duets and then made into versions for organ. Each organist has his own version. The original is actually in about six lines of music and it's not meant to be played by a human being. It's for an automaton, for a musical clock, a mechanical device. This means that it's almost sometimes impossible to play all the parts. You can put things in the pedals, the hands, depending on how daring you're feeling. And every organist has their own version. And this one is mine I'm going to play you now. It was greatly admired by a lot of composers. Beethoven owned a copy of the manuscript of this piece. And it's a huge fantasia, really. You can't imagine what it would sound like on a clock on small pipes. It begins with the opening theme, a big flourish, a fugal section. The theme from the opening comes back. There's a beautiful sort of andante in the middle, the big theme comes back, a double fugue happens, then the theme comes back from the beginning again, and then another fugal section at the end to close the entire piece, all building and building up and adding more parts all the time. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine what it'd been like if this went off every hour. This is Mozart's Fantasia in F minor. Thank you. 
as I said, I can't imagine what it would be like if you had a clock that played that every hour. It's a huge, huge piece of music and an amazing sound. So it's great to be able to play on this very sort of classically voiced organ. I'm going to move on to a piece now by an Italian composer, Alessandro Marcello. Uh, not a name that people really know. He's best known for one piece, his oboe concerto in D minor. Many years it was thought to be actually by Vivaldi. And Bach transcribed this piece for keyboard solo when he was at Weimar, but for keyboard solo, um, no pedals, just a harpsichord part. But the most famous part is the middle section, the adagio I'm going to play for you now. Now, it's a very, very beautiful melody, and in the original version it's actually quite simple, and the player is supposed to decorate it with their own ornaments and uh, improvised passages. However, when Bach wrote it out, he added all sorts of lines and changed harmonies and uh, just decorated it as he felt. So that's the version that most people play nowadays. Um, I've warmed it up a bit, I've added a pedal part, I'm going to use some of the string sounds of this organ and a lot of the solo flute and diapason sounds. Um, it's a very almost, a, you wouldn't believe it was Baroque really, it's a very romantic sounding piece of music and extremely beautiful and very, very moving. So I hope you enjoy this. This is Alessandro Marcello's Adagio from the Oboe Concerto in D minor.
before I finish today, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed seeing this beautiful chapel and that we've been able to come to Ellesmere and bring you both of these wonderful organs that you've seen over the past couple of concerts. Um, it's great that these instruments are so well looked after. As I mentioned, Paul Russell, the Custos, looks after them so well and fourth organ builders tune and maintain them and do a wonderful job of keeping them going in this Ellesmere College building chapel. Uh, it, it's wonderful to be here and so thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Tom for filming and recording and capturing the images of all the windows and uh, architecture and the organ today. And before I finish, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the final piece today. The Farandol by Bizet from his suite from La Lisienne. Now, Le Lisien was a play, and Bizet wrote the incidental music for it, some 27 pieces of music. Um, Bizet was often also quite short on money and used to accept commissions like this, and for the actual performances, he played the harmonium himself off stage. It was made into two suites after his death. Um, and I'm going to play the very last piece of the final suite, the Farandol. It begins with a march theme, which is actually known as March of the Kings. Uh, it's an epiphany piece and depicts the three kings um, and was published as a folk tune in France in the 19th century. It begins with that and then sets on this Farandol, um, a rustic peasant dance uh, from Provence. And there's sort of a stamping rhythm and you'll see throughout, not much happens in the pedals. We get a pedal D, which repeats over and over again, just about all the way through. It builds up and builds up and gets faster and faster and builds up to a huge flourish. It's a very exciting piece to finish with and suits this organ wonderfully, I think. So I hope you enjoy this and thank you again. This is the Farandol from La Lisienne by Bizet.